Okay, let's get started, everyone. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Today is February 25th, 2022, and we have uh, uh, Kyle Henderson with us for another Friday webinar. <clears throat> thanks for joining us all uh, as audience, and thanks, Kyle, in advance for the presentation. Before introducing Kyle, uh, I would like to remind you <clears throat> that the next uh, week's Friday seminar is in person by Julie Bloxen <clears throat> and her talk will be about Luan Salt. So a little bit about logistics of the current talk. Kyle's talk will last for 40 to 45 minutes and it is followed by 10 to 15 minutes uh, question and answer. <clears throat> For better organization of the webinar, I ask everyone to be muted during the talk, uh, but you can uh, keep writing questions in the chat function of the Zoom win window uh, or uh, wait until the uh, uh, until Kyle's uh, presentation finishes to ask your question vocally at the end of the talk. Uh, and also, uh, uh, this, this talk will be recorded and you can refer to that uh, after the webinar in the BEG uh, website. Uh, and now a little bit about Kyle Henderson's background. Kyle graduated with a, ba a Bachelor of Science degree in 2014 from uh, Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. He has spent two years in the gold mining sector and worked at mines in Victoria, Western Australia and Northern Territory. <clears throat> in 2016, he enrolled in uh, an MS program at McGill University in the hydrothermal geochemistry group under the supervision of Anthony Williams Jones and was promoted to the PhD program in 2017. His thesis focuses on trace mineral mobility during black shale di diagenesis with an emphasis on how metals like nickel, vanadium, zinc, and lithium partition among silicate, organic, and sulfide phases. His work centers on metal enriched sedimentary basins in Canada, South Africa, and China. <clears throat> and the title of today's talk is an interesting uh, topic, it is lithium in a smack over bright. Without further ado, let's invite Kyle to take over the stage. Kyle. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I will share my screen. <clears throat> Great. So uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, and so I think that should be sharing correctly now. Looks good. Excellent. Uh, so as was sort of uh, mentioned, I'm a, a PhD student up at, up at McGill University uh, in Quebec, in Montreal. And a lot of my work has sort of been focusing on uh, shale geochemistry and, and how uh, metals move around and mobilize or partition between the different phases uh, as sort of shales go through um, burial and diagenesis. And so I thought I might just show you some of the stuff that uh, some of the stuff that I've been working on, uh, if I have a pointer here. Uh, and so some of the rocks that we look at in uh, Yukon, which is the northern part of Canada and in South China, um, have um, sort of quite incredible metal content. So this is an example of, a, uh, of an exceptionally nickel rich shale, sort of that grades at about four weight percent nickel. Uh, in comparison, the sort of average black shale might be uh, 50 or 60 or so ppm. And so here's one of my favorite photos of a, uh, uh, late stage nickel sulfide uh, that's completely ripping through uh, this framboidal pyrite, uh, which has to do with, which what I think has to do with nickel remineralization um, during organic matter diagenesis. <clears throat> and in these rocks, we've also documented uh, a quite a interesting reaction where we're getting a sphalerite replace, uh, sphalerite dissolution, and then a millerite, which is a nickel sulfide, uh, replacing it in sort of in the later stages of diagenesis. And then in some of these adjacent um, shales, uh, we actually discovered a, a quite a rare mineral called monardite, which is a, a barium vanadium titanium oxide uh, that's sort of been identified in a handful of places in Russia. Um, but this thing grades about 13 uh, weight percent vanadium. Uh, and it occurs, it occurs in this sort of uh, 
thick package of vanadium rich shales. Uh, and we have a feeling that because of all of this sort of organic matter um, uh, intercalculating with this, uh, with this mineral, we actually think it's related to vanadium mobility via uh, liquid hydrocarbons. <clears throat> and so we also sort of are looking at um, some of the gold systems that we find in South Africa as they have uh, quite a lot of organic matter. And so all of this sort of like light gray phase that you see here uh, is pyrobitumen. And it has all of this embedded detrital uraninite and detrital pyrite. And so we're looking at the uh, ability of these hydrocarbons to transport uranium. And in some instances, there's a whole bunch of gold. And so we're looking at how the, uh, how the gold, which probably was brought in from a, a aqueous fluid, interacted with these, with these liquid hydrocarbons. We also sort of look at how uh, sort of just, you know, trace metals might just change through diagenesis. And so this is sort of tracking some shales in Alberta and Canada, uh, and then looking at how the sort of trace element content changes um, through burial, and then comparing that with what we know, uh, the trace element content of a whole bunch of oils uh, that we got from the geological survey. And so this sort of look at sedimentary diagenesis and siliciclastic diagenesis and the partitioning of some of these different metals um, sort of got us onto the topic of looking at lithium because that's sort of a big a big topic at the moment in Alberta and Saskatchewan uh, with the lithium content of oil filled brines. And so this is just a plot, sort of just a histogram plot of uh, a data set that was collected by the Alberta Geological Survey. And you can sort of see that the vast majority of the data um, is below about 10 milligrams per liter, which is pretty low. Uh, but we have a whole lot of data that's greater than 10 milligrams per liter. And so people have sort of been investigating whether or not you could actually extract some of the lithium um, from, these, uh, from these formations. And the same thing's true if you look at the, uh, you look at the USGS water database, uh, which has a lot more samples, uh, you can see that most of the samples sort of plot uh, pretty low is about less than sort of 10 milligrams per liter. Uh, but you do get a whole lot of samples that are plotting quite higher, sort of above 10 or even above 100. And so really <clears throat> what we're kind of interested in is that we know that there's these, some of these formations have this sort of lithium enrichment and then some formations don't. And so there's two examples I'll talk about today, which is the Smackover formation uh, in, in the Gulf of Mexico and then the Bakken formation uh, up here in, in Canada and North Dakota. Um, but we can compare that to other formations. And in this case, if you look at sort of Silurian to Pennsylvanian reservoirs in Illinois, they have, um, sort of virtually no lithium. So the question is, why is that that difference? And this is a sort of reason that people are interested in this. Uh, this is sort of a projection done by Rio Tinto. And I think that by about 2030, uh, almost half of the lithium supply will go directly to electric vehicles. And so as that market evolves and as that market grows, um, we're going to be at a, a relatively large deficit in terms of the amount of lithium we need. And so uh, there's been some concerted efforts to uh, to find more lithium. And there's sort of been not a recent advancement, um, but sort of the economics has made it much more feasible where most of the lithium at the moment either comes from hard rock mining from pegmatites or from solar evaporation, which are sort of lengthy processes. Um, but there's a sort of different type of a different way of doing it, which is just called direct extraction. And so this is just a company that does this and Alberta, I just took this from their website where they actually just pump in the raw brine from formation waters, and then they just extract only the lithium, and then they can sort of spit out a highly concentrated um, version of it, which only takes a matter of hours rather than solar evaporation, for instance, which would take months. And so one of the things we need to decide, or at least we need to talk about, is what do we mean by enriched if we're looking at these sort of different formation water chemistries? Uh, I showed you a you know, distribution of a whole lot of values, but where do we actually draw the line? And so given that a lot of these formation waters include some sort of modified seawater, it seems like a reasonable place to start. Uh, if you take the lithium concentration of seawater, sort of about 0.1 or so milligrams per liter, and then you look at some of the really high values that you find in these brines, uh, there has to be some sort of cutoff of where we're going to call it enriched and, and when we're going to start to care about it. And so you can accomplish that task by sort of just uh, looking at the evaporation of seawater. And so this is just if you take a theoretical liter of seawater with that initial concentration uh, and you evaporate it to effective dryness, 
what you'll see is that the brine will evolve to a, to a sort of chemistry with about 10 or so milligrams per, li uh, milligrams per li uh, liter of lithium. And even if you're at halite saturation, which is one of the sort of more um, predominant evaporite minerals to precipitate out of evaporating seawater, um, that would only give you a fluid with uh, one or two milligrams per, per liter. And the reason for this is that lithium is entirely conservative. It doesn't really like to partition off into minerals. Uh, and so as you slowly or as you quickly remove all of that water, um, all of the lithium will just keep partitioning into the brine and it will just get steadily, steadily uh, enriched. And so we can use this and we might decide that a cutoff value or a suitable cutoff value would be you know, 10 ppm of lithium. And so anything above that, you have to sort of explain. Uh, but for economic sort of considerations, you know, usually a, a threshold value would be close to um, would be close to about 50 milligrams per liter of lithium. And some of the uh, some of the companies that I've spoken to that sort of explore for this sort of stuff, uh, depending on the technology they have, they sort of need about you know 60 to 70 odd milligrams per liter if they have a significant enough um, reservoir uh, in order to make it an economic project. <clears throat> and so really, what this all boils down to is some of these brines have lithium and some don't, and we don't really know why. But we're not the actual, you know, we're, we're almost never the first people to investigate things. And curiously, there was this, a, a whole series of papers in the 80s and 90s that looked at formation of water chemistry all over the place. And quite a lot of them had lithium data, <clears throat> but relatively few of them sort of, you know, focused anything on, on the lithium, which is fine because they were sort of trying to explain the bulk chemistry and lithium is mostly a trace element. Uh, and so they were sort of happy to sort of, you know, to say it could either be coming from evaporites or it could come from silicates. Uh, but there has been some sort of more uh, recent work uh, that we should sort of acknowledge. And so there was a study done, there was a series of papers done on the Marcellus formation, uh, which is up in the sort of the northern part of the states. And what was kind of interesting is they have this sort of distribution of lithium where in the north you had relatively high lithium values. And in the south you had relatively low lithium values. And the idea was is that the lithium was caused by uh, alteration of volcanic ash. And then uh, at one point, the lithium would partition into the shale during diagenesis because um, they had these uh, whole rock samples from the sort of the Marcellus shale. Uh, and they advocated that some of these higher values of sort of 85 or so ppm meant that the lithium was sort of partitioning into the actual shale. Uh, but when you look at the sort of more characteristic values of the actual shale, they're sort of, uh, they're, also, they're also pretty similar. So there's probably not that much lithium going into the shale itself. Uh, and the idea that this can come from sort of volcanic ash beds or bentonites, um, you know, bentonites can have a lot of lithium and there's definitely a lot of bentonites in the Marcellus formation, but whether or not the distribution of those bentonites and the lithium content, because those things are unknown, uh, whether or not they explain this sort of um, li lithium distribution is sort of not really clear. And then the other thing is even their lower lithium brines at 50 milligrams per liter is still uh, quite enriched. And so there's also um, work that's been done on the smack over formation, which you're probably more familiar with, uh, which is a big um, uh, carbonate reservoir uh, from the Jurassic, which also has a bimodality in its lithium distribution. Uh, but the model for this that was done in the 90s uh, sort of suggested that the lithium was being introduced through underlying uh, red beds um, of what's called the Eagle Mills formation, which I'll show you. But this is just a plot of what those of that distribution and sort of have, uh, in this case, the bimodality is related to the, the sulfur content of the fluid. This is of the brine. And so the H2S rich fluids had more lithium sort of approaching 300 or so ppm, which would be milligrams per liter. Uh, and then these H2S poor brines had about sort of 100 to 150. It's not really clear to me how you would actually manage to relate lithium and reduced sulfur if the source rock is an oxidized system, because it's sort of these underlying red beds, this sort of just like catch all term that's used to describe anything with a lot of iron oxides. Uh, and then the other thing, a similar thing with the Marcellus formation is that this lower end, this sort of lithium poor water is still relatively enriched. And so there's no real clear about, there's no answer about why that is. Uh, we have these sort of uh, carbonates from Alberta. So this is sort of just a map of what um, the North American continent looked like during the middle Devonian. 
so Marcellus is over here, and then you have uh, where Smackover will eventually sort of be down here. And then we are in Alberta with these, uh, what's called the Leduc and Nisku brines, um, in which the model for these, in which the lithium can sort of range from about 30 odd milligrams per liter to 70 odd milligrams per liter, uh, has been suggested to either come from dissolution of salt uh, or the interaction with silicates or dolomitization. And so there seems to be a plethora of processes possible. Uh, and then you have the Bakken formation in North Dakota, uh, which sort of has about 60 odd uh, milligrams per liter of lithium, uh, except there's no published model for where the lithium in the Bakken um, might be coming from. And so there seems to be a whole lot of propositions where in some cases you might be able to get lithium from salt, you might be able to get lithium from silicates, but even in this lithium from silicates, it's not really clear what the reaction is and how the lithium is being extracted. Uh, and so one of the things that we're doing is that uh, we're sort of investigating some of these higher lithium brines. I was originally gonna focus on some of the smack over stuff, uh, but in the fall when Omicron came through that sort of curtailed my efforts to travel. And so uh, at the moment, we're focusing on these sort of Leduc and Nisku and Bakken brines in, uh, in Alberta, and then investigating some lower lithium brines that we can sort of see, um, which is this thing called the Ursulae formation, which is a Cretaceous age uh, sandy shale that has uh, less lithium, well, you're typically about 15 or so ppm milligrams per liter. But our approach is doing things sort of petrographically. And I got my I got a UPS notification that my thin sections are due to arrive today, uh, which is always good. And so in the meantime that I've been working on sort of doing some um, statistical analysis to sort of see if we can tease out more from the data uh, than what, from what the authors published sort of um, several decades ago. And so I took about 800 or so samples from the USGS water database that had a collection of major elements. Uh, and you can sort of see that plot here where you have, you know, most of the data is plotting uh, below that critical threshold of 50 milligrams per liter, but then you still have a whole bunch of samples that plot higher. And so on the right here, you have a violin plot, sort of sewing a similar sort of thing. We have a whole bunch of samples that are depleted in lithium and a whole bunch of samples that are relatively enriched in lithium. And then one of the multivariant techniques that I'm a big fan of is called principal component analysis which is effectively just a, a dimension a reduction technique. And so you can see on this sort of little image here uh, on the right, that as uh, these red bars are a measure of error between a regression line and your data point. So you can just have a Y variable and an X variable, and you wanted to plot a, a regression line through it, uh, you have to be able to track the error. And you can sort of see that as this regression curve is coming to where it should belong, uh, you get something that has the lowest amount of error and the highest amount of variance that's sort of projected along that line. And you can do pretty much the same thing in multi-dimensional space. So instead of doing this with two variables, you can do it with 20 variables. And what you can then do is that you can compute, you can convert each of your original variables uh, into what we call uh, principal components, which are just sort of linear sums of those variables. Uh, in order to be able to reduce the amount of variables that you have to look at. And so you can see if I sort of, as this regression line is sort of coming to where it sort of belongs, uh, I can then take that major regression line, which is explaining most of the variance, and I can call that a principal component. And then I can take something that's orthogonal to it, and I can call that a second principal component. And then if you just do that in 12 in multidimensional space, uh, you can actually sort of reduce a lot of your data uh, so you only have to look at a certain, uh, you only have to look at less information. And so if you do those sorts of models, um, you get what's called um, principal component loadings, which I'm not going to go through all of this, but you can sort of see that I've added in 12 original variables. And so it spits out 12 original principal components. And then these coefficients are just sort of what you would get if you wanted to describe PC1, it would be the linear sum of all of my variables with these coefficients attached. And so the, the strength of how important the variable is, is just determined by how big this number is between zero and one. So if it's one, it's really important. If it's negative one, it's really important. If it's sort of a small number, it doesn't really matter. And then these percentages at the top here, just explaining how much, uh, how much data is actually within that principal component. And so I'm just gonna take, I can take an arbitrary number and say, I'm gonna ignore uh, 
those bottom five because they don't really explain that much. And then because I'm only really interested in lithium for this talk, I'm only gonna focus on these three, um, these three components. And so what you can do is you can sort of plot them as just normal biplots. And so here I've plotted principal component two and five as the X and Y axis. And then I can plot all of my samples on it, which are the black dots. And then I can also plot my original variables as vectors. And then what I can do is I can use the relationship between these vectors and the relationship between the vectors and the samples uh, to interpret data um, that might have been missed in, uh, in, in doing this sort of, you know, if you had a whole bunch of data and you just plotted your whatever variable one versus variable two and variable one versus variable three and variable one versus variable four, and you just did that sequentially and you had 12 variables, you'd sort of be there for a really long time and you might not be able to actually discover anything. And so here, if you look at the angle between the vectors, if you have an angle of zero, that means you have a really tight correlation and it's positive. And then if you have a negative correlation, if you're at 180 degrees, you have a quite a negative correlation. And you can sort of see in this plot uh, that lithium is highly correlated with potassium and bromine, which is what you, these elements in here. Uh, and it's sort of moderately correlated with the lithium and the boron and then lithium and strontium. Uh, but curiously, boron and strontium are not related because they're sort of at a, a 40 or 5 degrees angle. And if I look at the, those other two components that I had, which is component five and component six, I get the same sort of story. I can see that my lithium out here is positively correlated with potassium and there's also bromine in there, but it's negatively correlated with boron and it doesn't really appear to be correlated with strontium. And so I can see that there's some consistency of where in my original data set where lithium is quite important, it's continuously correlating with potassium and, bro and, and, and bromine. And so if I just take potassium and bromine out and you can sort of just, you know, you only have three variables and you just sort of plot bromine versus lithium and bromine versus potassium and then potassium versus lithium. You can sort of see that these plots are kind of messy. There's some blobs, there's some straight lines, there's some flat lines. You can probably get your horoscope out of here. I think there's probably some constellations you can see. And so it would be really good if we could then, so we've taken our 12 variables and we've reduced it down to three. And it would be really nice if we could take those three variables and reduce it down to one plot. And so you can do that by just sort of ratioing the, pota the, um, the potassium and the, and the bromine and then just versus that with lithium. And so a lot of that data sort of starts to cluster near the origin, but then you get these two higher trends where you have some that go off to high potassium bromine ratios and then you have some data that go off to lower potassium bromine ratios, which is apparently where you get a lot of the lithium. And so if I look at that high potassium bromine line, uh, we find an interesting sort of uh, trend, which is these really high samples with the highest, the highest potassium bromine. Uh, that was the Bakken formation that's sort of in, the, in North Dakota and Saskatchewan. If you look at, there's a collection of samples at a little bit lower values, which turn out to be the Leduc and the Niskew formations, which are the same age, but just instead of being in uh, North Dakota, you're in Alberta. <clears throat> and then there's a little collection of other samples at lower values, which is what we call the Ursulite formation, which is a sandy shale, which doesn't really have a lot of lithium, but we're going to use it as a comparison uh, to this trend. And what I find kind of interesting is that these are, uh, this Bakken formation, oh, my colors changed. This Bakken formation and this Leduc formation, even though one's a, sh uh, one's a shale, Bakken formation is mostly shale, and the Leduc formations are all carbonates, they seem to have a similar trend in their chemistry related to lithium. And if you look at that lower trend towards uh, lower uh, potassium bromine ratios, you can sort of see it has a similar co collection of, of those formations we looked at, which is the Marcellus formation, and the Smackover formation. And there's other things in here like the Utica Shale. Uh, the Clinton formation is a Silurian sandstone in, uh, in Ohio. <clears throat> and so what we've done is we've taken, you know, the original data that we put in, which was 12 variables. We saw in the data that three of the variables seem to be important. And then we can just look at those two variables. So we can just talk about what potassium comes from and where bromine comes from. Uh, and most of potassium can either come from silicate minerals, clays and feldspars, 
or it could come from the dissolution of potassium salts. And both of these are models for where you get lithium from. And then bromine uh, mostly sort of comes from, if you want it in the brine, most of it comes from just evaporation of seawater and then uh, dissolution, recrystallization of different um, evaporite minerals. <clears throat> And so if you want to look at how silicate minerals and fluids interact with each other, uh, it can be quite good to look at strontium isotopes. And so strontium uh, has an isotopic system because of the radioactive decay of rubidium. And so rubidium-87 decays into strontium-87. And then if you normalize your strontium-87 to your strontium-86, which is, which is a stable isotope, um, you can get these different pools of strontium in your rock that are relatively isolated from each other. So you'll have a rubidium and strontium content in your carbonate rock that as soon as that carbonate is precipitated out, that strontium will be sealed into that component. And so you'll have some in your carbonate, you might have some if you have salt in your rock, you might have some in your feldspars, you'll have some in your clay minerals. And so you get these isolated pools of strontium. And because this ratio doesn't fractionate because of um, diagenetic processes. The only thing that's really going to change this ratio is the evolution of rubidium into strontium. And so if at some later point in time you get mixing between those pools, uh, you can track, you might be able to track how that fluid chemistry has evolved. And so this is just an example. Uh, if you sort of had a, uh, <clears throat> if you sort of had a theoretical, theoretical rock, um, and you have these sorts of different minerals in you. So you might have some clay minerals and it'll have some sort of, you know, there'll be some elements that are absorbed onto the surface, things like lithium, things like strontium. Uh, you'll have uh, elements in the actual structural component, which might be things like potassium or things like rubidium 87. Uh, you might have some of these sort of carbonates or you might have salt. And so they can be composed of different, uh, different minerals. You might have strontium with some calcium or some, or, or some potassium that might have rubidium associated with it. Because the, the, utility, the, the other utility of it is because the rubidium is in the one plus state, it's going to be affiliated um, with potassium. But because strontium is in a two plus state, it'll be affiliated with a different suite of minerals, <clears throat> different suite of elements, things like magnesium two plus, calcium two plus. Um, and so you might also have some feldspars which will have a sort of its own um, collection of different minerals. And then if you did a whole rock analysis, you would get the sort of just the weighted proportion of all of these things, um, which might not really tell you much about how much lithium is being held within each of these mineral phases. But the idea is if I then interact that with the water and that water could be formation water, it could be modified seawater, uh, it could be from, could be sourced internally from, um, from the unit itself, uh, or it could have arrived externally and it's sort of been flushed through. <clears throat> but when you do that, you're going to get an exchange between your mineral phases and the actual fluid. And in some instances, you'll get minerals that go uh, into the fluid. And so this is an example here of calcium and magnesium. Uh, during the process dolomitization, the calcium goes into the fluid and then the magnesium goes into the calcite to form dolomite. Uh, you can also have exchange reactions between things like feldspars. And so you might have this process called albitization, which is where sodium goes into a feldspar and potassium comes out of a fluid. Uh, you can get a variety of different clay mineral reactions. And so all of these things are going to release a whole bunch of elements. And so if lithium and strontium are being sourced from a similar area, <clears throat> because most of the strontium will be, because most of the radiogenic strontium will come from uh, come from silicates, which is where the sort of proposition for lithium is, uh, then that might produce a correlation in the data set, which would be useful for interpreting the evolution of the lithium concentration. And so if we have a look at these if sort of lithium isotopic composition um, versus the lithium content that I've expressed here is just the inverse of lithium. And I do that for the high potassium bromine brines. Uh, I want to, so I'll, I'll show you that in a second, but I first wanted to introduce to you two values that will become important in this discussion. And this red star down the bottom here uh, is representative of, of Devonian seawater. And so it has a relatively low isotopic composition, and it also has a relatively low lithium content. The actual lithium content of 1 over lithium will probably approach a value of 10, and so it doesn't really plot on here. But basically in the bottom right, that's representative of seawater. And then in this top left, you have a star that is, that is representative of, 
of something called the maximum strontium isotope of basinal shale, which doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, uh, but it's the lithium isotopic composition of formation waters if you interact them with shale. So you just take a regular basinal shale and you take sort of a formation water chemistry that's reasonable uh, and you interact those two things, you will extract some of the strontium from the shale uh, and then you can take the strontium isotopic composition of that fluid. And really your strontium is only coming from the sort of soluble salt, the carbonates and any adsorbed ions. So when I was talking about that deportment of strontium, there's a whole bunch of strontium that might be in the silicate minerals uh, that won't really be involved in these low temperature mineral reactions. And so if you take a bulk value, you're gonna get something that's distorted. And so you really only wanna look at the stuff that's soluble in these formation waters. But the other thing I need to mention is that this value of, of 0.712 is really only applicable for the Devonian in Alberta uh, because it comes from the Alberta, um, Alberta shales. <clears throat> but if I plot this uh, for those high potassium bromine brines, with things like the Bakken formation, the Ursuli formation, and the Leduc and the Nisku formation, you can see that there's, uh, there's some kind of interesting trends that we can observe. And so First off, you can see for this Ursuli formation in these in the red squares, you sort of get a nice straight line um, between those two end members that I sort of spoke of. And so because the this is the way I've plotted this, I have a strontium, I have an isotope on my y-axis, and then my x-axis is the is a one over lithium. I can these are just sort of linear mixing curves. Well, they're not linear, but they're mixing curves between two end members. And so I have I have an end member. Uh, the sort of red A is representing some sort of composition. And then I have the red B, which is some sort of composition. And then my samples are plotting somewhere along that mixing trend. And I can do the same thing with the Bakken formation with these sort of yellow, uh, yellow circles between, uh, between A and B. And so because if I, look at those, if I look at those formation water chemistries, the heaviest strontium isotope uh, is less than that maximum, maximum basinal shale value it likely suggests that the, lith the, uh, the, the strontium isotopes are not interacting um, strongly with the, uh, with the highly res residual fraction, the sort of um, very crystalline silicates. And you can also see that the lithium composition is sort of going to have to be about 10 to 25 ppm, because uh, you can sort of just read it as, well, A is sort of, you know, ha might have a strontium value of somewhere around 0.711, and it'll have a lithium value of sort of somewhere between you know, zero and 0 0.02, which is one over lithium. So that'll sort of be uh, what it is for A. <clears throat> and then B will just sort of be modified seawater. And then the same thing is, is true for this yellow line, which is the Bakken formation. Uh, and then the differences between these things about why does, why does Bakken have more lithium for the same strontium composition? Because you can sort of just shift all of this, this red line over uh, to the Bakken is likely due to the depositional differences. The Bakken formation is a much, uh, is, you know, a, a thicker uh, black shale, whereas the, uh, whereas the Ursuli formation is much more of a sort of sandy shale in the Cretaceous. And so if I look at these depositional conditions, I can sort of just, as a comparison, I can just show you what the lithium aluminum content of these formations is, is just a sort of a comparison. And so if you look at an average shale, the lithium aluminum value is approximately sort of like seven. The reason I'm expressing this as a ratio of aluminum is I wanna know uh, the actual whole rock value is sort of dependent on a whole bunch of different processes uh, and it can be quite misleading. And so if you normalize it to something, which in this case, aluminum, you get a sense of how much, um, how much lithium is gonna be in, in your detrital composition, because most of the aluminum is sourced from detrital rocks. And so if we're trying to think about the differences between the Ursuli and the Bakken, um, the depositional conditions will make um, a bigger difference. And so you can see there's some consistency in this because the lithium aluminum ratio of the Bakken is 20 compared to the Ursuli at six. Maybe the reason that the Bakken brines have more lithium is because the Bakken formation had more lithium. <clears throat> and if I do the same thing with the Leduc and the uh, and the Nisku formation, uh, you can sort of see we have this like collection of three little uh, clots of data. 
And we have these two major trends um, that I know are about 120 kilometers apart from each other. And then we have this little sort of like lone triplets just sort of doing its own thing. And I know that's 30 kilometers to the east. And so I'll just show you a map so you can see an explanation for this. So this is uh, a map of, on the left, this is sort of a bigger map of Canada and you have the sort of uh, northern part of the states. And we're in a, a, a city called Edmonton. And so on this left diagram, you have this Edmonton with all of these sort of blue squiggles. And this blue squiggles is reflective of the, uh, of the uh, thickness of the Leduc formation. And so you can see that, you know, my lighter values, my lighter strontium isotope values that are clustering here actually come from these southern reefs. And then my northern values, uh, well, my higher radiogenic values are coming from uh, these uh, more northern reefs. And then what I can see is that my sort of lone pair, my lone triplets out here are actually coming from its own little isolated reef, which is what, what's called the Redwater Reef. And if I show you a cross section from north, roughly speaking from north to south, you have the Redwater Reef, and then you have the, what's actually called the Leduc Reef, and then you have the uh, Duhamel Reef. On a cross section, you can sort of see um, the sort of red water is in the north, and then you go to the Leduc, uh, and then you go all the way down uh, south to the Duhamel. And then on top of this, this sort of pinky color here is the, um, is the Niscu formation, which is just a carbonate shelf. So these Leduc reefs are, are the, the Leduc formation are these reef buildups, and then the Niscu is, is a huge carbonate, uh, carbonate shelf that comes across it. And so if I plot the Niscu formation, for instance, you can sort of see that you do get a mixing trend it's not particularly strong, but it's sort of pointing at something at uh, high strontium isotopic compositions, but lower lithium, and then something sort of mysterious uh, down on the bottom left. If I plot the uh, mixing lines between the Leduc formation, then I get something much more reasonable, uh, which is I can sort of plot the red water to Leduc, which is the sort of more uh, east-west-ish flow. That makes sense. And I can plot something between sort of more north-south, which might be the Leduc and the, uh, uh, and the Duhamel reefs. And so that seems to make sense. Uh, but if I, because these systems seem to be interconnected with each other, there seems to be some sort of connectivity. You can actually plot it as a, uh, as a three-way mixing line. And you sort of get a bizarre situation where you have sort of sedimentary clastics because you can sort of see that our strontium isotopic composition doesn't, doesn't exceed that maximum, maximum basinal value. You have something of the approaching Devonian seawater in the bottom right, but then you get this fluid in the bottom left, which is some sort of magical fluid because it has seawater strontium isotopic compositions, but its lithium value is sort of at least an order of two, or at least two orders of magnitude higher than what, Devo than what seawater can give you. Uh, and so that red star in the middle is how you would determine the mixing ratios between these three fluids. And so while mixing ratios might be able to explain the fluid chemistry today, it doesn't really give you uh, how much, it doesn't really give you an idea about where this sort of source region of this magical fluid might've come from. But I'll come back to that in a, I'll show you about that in a, in a, in a little bit. Um, if we now do the same thing with the lower potassium bromine brines, uh, in this case, I'm only gonna look at this Mac over formation, probably just due to time constraints. Wait a minute, wrong. Okay, I'm good. Uh, and so I have this whole bunch of data that I separated out into that same system that I did before. You have some H2S rich ones and you have some H2S poor fluids. Uh, and you can sort of see that some of those fluids plot very nicely. And then you get a whole bunch that plot sort of just out to the right. Um, and looking at the papers that these, come, these came from, from the 90s, which these are excellent papers, uh, those samples probably are plotting closer to fault systems, so they might be sort of tapping into different fluids. But if I just look at the H2S rich fluids, I can do the same thing as I've done before. I can create a mixing line uh, between, you know, a high lithium fluid and a low lithium fluid. Um, but remember that maximum basinal shale value is not applicable. And so I have to use some other value. And so I have this red star, which is probably Jurassic seawater. Uh, and then uh, some people have looked at sort of just leaching sedimentary clays about how much strontium isotope, uh, isotopes can you get from these clays. And you can sort of see there's a range of values that you can sort of get. Uh, and then the question is, and that sort of fits with what we know of um, how heavy these strontium isotopes from the brines are. And so the question is, do we have anything uh, that might be able to explain these um, uh, the values that we actually see. 
And so this is a sort of cross-section of uh, the sort of smack over formation. So you have the smack over formation here, and then you have um, these sort of underlying salt systems, which is called the Luan salt, which I, apparently is what the talk next week is going to be on. And they have strontium isotopes that's approaching Jurassic seawater. Uh, and then if you go basin wood into the deeper part of the basin, uh, you have this sort of Bouzier Hainesville shale system uh, that has strontium isotopes sort of, you know, uh, in the middle of that trend that we defined before. And so it seems somewhat reasonable that your sort of mixing line is going to be between some sort of sedimentary siliciclastic and then, and then Jurassic seawater. Uh, but when we look at, there was that other trend of data uh, that came from sort of the H2S poor fluids, uh, and you're probably actually getting mixing between three different sources uh, because, you know, in some instances, they don't have as much lithium. Uh, and the original authors of those studies proposed that some of the lithium is likely coming from these sort of like underlying red beds. And so this is sort of the uh, clastics underlying the anhydrite. And so you're, mo you're mostly getting sort of, I would say, three sources. You're getting some from the anhydrite, some from the underlying units you know, from the anhydrite, which would be the things focusing along faults. Uh, you'd be getting some of the uh, strontium from uh, the Luan salt, and then you'd be getting some of the lithium from the, uh, uh, from the actual Hainesville shale. And the problem with this is that we don't know how much lithium the Bouzier shale has. I've tried to sort of find samples of it. I was, I was hoping to do um, field work, but Omicron sort of got in the way of that. So if anyone happens to have a paperweight of Bouzier shale that you're not using anymore, I, uh, I'd be more than happy to take it off your hands. But it seems somewhat reasonable, and there's some consistency in the formation waters that we're looking at, where we can just define uh, a sort of higher lithium end member and a lower lithium end member, and then just create a simple mixing line between them. And so if we want to evaluate, well, it seems reasonable from what I presented that the source of the strontium isotopes and likely the lithium is coming from these sort of sedimentary rocks. Uh, but some people have proposed you have to get it from the actual basement, the sort of like the crystalline basement. And so if I show you, for instance, this is the, a cross section in Alberta that we were looking at. You sort of have these middle Devonian Leduc reefs and the upper Devonian sort of Niscu reefs, or Niscu carbonates. And I showed you that the average strontium isotope was sort of relatively low. And I gave you that basinal value of 0.712. And I said, well, it seems reasonable that this is where you're getting your strontium from. So it also seems reasonable that this is where you're getting your lithium from. Uh, but just to sort of give the argument, it's sort of a, a critical analysis. If you look at these lower lying systems, um, the Cambrian rocks have much higher radiogenic values. So approaching 0.76. And then you also get the Precambrian rocks, which have an even higher strontium isotopic value of approaching one. And so it would seem unlikely that these can be your source of your strontium without exceeding this, this sort of maximum basinal value. Uh, and so it makes much more sense that we're uh, tapping into uh, the, um, the, the sedimentary rocks rather than the basement itself. And so it's likely that the sedimentary rocks are the source of the lithium and the source of the strontium. Uh, people have sort of proposed that these evaporites might be a source. And so if we look, this is um, sort of Alberta, Saskatchewan, you know, the sort of the northern part of the states down here, North Dakota. And so we were talking about the Leduc reefs near Edmonton. And this is a, El the Elk Point Basin is a series of, this is an evaporite sequence. Uh, and so all of the sort of beige color would be mostly a halite. And then this sort of brownie color will be, um, will be potash, which is potassium salt. Um, there's not a lot of, there's actually surprisingly not a lot of data out there on the lithium content of salt. I've tried to sort of find analysis, but it's really difficult. Um, some of the data I have found is that there was a salt core taken uh, in the western part and the eastern part of Alberta, and all of those samples had less than one ppm. It was at detection limit for lithium. And then someone in Manitoba took what's called a salt solution, which is where they just dissolve the salt and then they analyze the, the leach. Um, it also had less than one ppm of lithium. And so it doesn't really sound like you can store that much lithium into, uh, into evaporites. Uh, and this is um, a series of samples that came from a mine in Germany. And they, their brine compositions sort of vary from, you know, less than one milligram per liter lithium, almost all the way up to 200 milligrams per liter of lithium. But then when you look at the actual salt whole rock samples, they have negligible lithium. And so these are, um, these are different sort of potash level of salts. Carnalite is a magnesium potassium salt. Halite is just a sodium chloride salt. 
solvite is just KCL, it's just a potassium salt, and you get hardly any lithium, um, less than 4 ppm, which is their detection limit uh, in these samples. And so these authors sort of tentatively concluded that the lithium was probably coming from the under the overlying and the intercalculating sediments. And so I think I'm sort of slowly running out of time. Uh, if you just sort of, I just want to go back to that that trend that we sort of noticed before to see if we can say, well, like you know, what do these two trends actually now mean? And we can highlight that with the with sort of the Bakken formation, where as you approach the sort of high potassium bromine values, it's because you're getting more potassium. Uh, whereas your bromine is staying relatively the same. Uh, and that's likely because you're altering it with feldspars. And so I showed you what that reaction might be. It could be, uh, it could be albatization. Uh, it could be a whole bunch of different, uh, different reactions, but it's likely where you're getting feld uh, potassium is coming from the feldspar and it's going into your actual rock. And that, by, and that might be where you're getting the sort of lithium from in the feldspar fraction. Because you have relatively normal levels of bromine and strontium, you know that there's no salt contribution. Uh, when evaporites precipitate out, uh, they incorporate a fair amount of bromine because the bromine can substitute in for the chloride ion relatively easily. But then if you recrystallize that system, you kick all of that bromine out. So if you take a huge bed of halite, for instance, and you absorb a whole bunch and you incorporate a whole bunch of bromine and then you dissolve it, all of the bromine gets kicked out. Even if you recrystallize the salt, all of the bromine is gone. And so this higher trend between to higher potassium levels is likely coming from feldspar alteration. And then if you look at that lower trend, you get a different sort of system, which is in the reverse, which is where you have potassium depletion, but then boron, a bromine enrichment and strontium enrichment and this is because uh, of a different siliciclastic process, which is illicilization, which is when you want to convert a smectite, which is a sort of highly disordered clay, into an illite, which is a much more ordered clay, that requires potassium. There's more potassium in illite than there is in smectite, and so you need potassium in order to make that reaction proceed. Uh, and then in order to get uh, the sort of bromine enrichment from the smack formation, which sort of you know, I think it's in Arkansas that like bromine is actually mined from these smack over formation waters. They literally stick a bromine filter on that formation water and they just extract all of the bromine. And that's likely because of this sort of dissolved salt contribution. And so the, um, the underlying Luan salt is a sort of hundreds of meters thick, uh, I think it's like 1500 meter thick salt package um, that probably took in a whole, bunch of, whole much of bromine when it precipitated out. And then during fluid flow, it's recrystallized and all of that bromine has been kicked out and it's gone into the smack over. Uh, but in order to get the, the potassium depletion, you have to do it through illicitization. And so that's likely the connection with the Boussier shale uh, where you've caused this sort of potassium depletion and then it's extracted a whole bunch of lithium and then that's flowed upwards into the smack over. I, I think I'm, I'm almost done here. Um, one quick comment on, the, uh, on that mysterious brine. I don't, that, that might explain the sort of Leduc and Niskew mixing curves. I don't particularly have a good answer for it yet. Um, you might be able to do it through weird distribution coefficients of bromine and lithium and salt. Um, it might be a variant of what um, the Marcellus formation is, which is just volcanic ash, except there's, I don't really think there's enough ash in, the, in Alberta to do it. Uh, or you might be able to do it through um, a different sort of system where you have an exceptionally highly evolved detrital component where you have like a lot of lithium and then you're only sort of tapping into say like 1% of it. So if you can, if you can sort of tap into some mineral that has thousands of PPM lithium and you only get a little bit out of it, then maybe you might be able to do it that way. But we have limited, we don't really have that much radiogenic strontium. So it doesn't, I'm not really sure yet. Uh, and so if we sort of just summarize what we've looked at, uh, you know, why do some of these basins have lithium in rich waters? You have to think about the source of the lithium but then you also have to think about the availability about whether or not that lithium can participate in mineral reactions. And so some of the work that I'm going to be doing, hopefully my thin sections arrive today, uh, is to do this petrographically uh, because most people have sort of done it with sort of chemical data or sequential extraction data. Um, but I think it's really look at, it's important to look at the mineral paragenesis. Uh, and then what you can do is that if you know you have some sort of source rock and you know it's, it's mineral chemistry, uh, you have a fluid rock ratio, and then you undergo some sort of mineral reaction uh, you can calculate all of the compositions either through um, electron microprobe and laser ablation. Uh, and then if you know how much fluid you have, you can sort of calculate what the formation water chemistry should be. Uh, 
And then that'll be interesting to know if the felt, if the lithium is coming from the feldspars or if it's coming from the clay minerals, and then whether or not you can make the mass balance work just sort of internally. And so that's the sort of stuff um, that I'll be working on uh, hopefully in the near future. And that is my talk. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kyle. It was great presentation. So let's start uh, with questions and answers part. Uh, anyone, if you want to ask a verbal, uh, a vocal question, please unmute yourself and ask it. In the chat function, I see that uh, uh, Lee Todd asked, uh, uh, first he mentioned great presentation, and then he asked, is there a way to get a copy of the presentation? That's fine with me. I can email it to someone. I don't mind. Okay. Yeah, if you email it to us, that would be great. We can send it to him. And then Peke uh, mentioned, thanks for the presentation. Did you compare the PCA for different locations or FM? If yes, how do they compare? Um, what might be the cause? Um, I have not done that. Um... One of the problems with PCA is that you need significantly more samples than you do variables. So if you have 12 variables, you need probably an order of magnitude more samples in order to get the, the variance to make sense. And so for some of those formations, you know, the Bakken formation and the Leduc, there's only a handful of samples available. Uh, even when you go into something like the Smackova formation, there's you know, there might be 50 or so samples that have all of the variables that you need. Uh, and so I haven't done um, PCA on those individual formations um, as of yet. So uh, for clarity, PCA stands for Principal Component Analysis, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So the next question is uh, by William. He mentioned that he likes to have a copy of the presentation and recording. William, the recording will be available on the BG uh, website after the uh, webinar. And then, uh, yeah, they, they now posted the link for the recording uh, that is going to be uploaded in that link. Uh, and so- uh, Kyle, could I ask a, could I ask a sure. question here? It's, it's Andy yeah, Robinson. Go ahead. Um, yeah, Kyle, I mean, I've, uh, I've sort of been working in the lithium industry for, uh, for a few years now. Um, and um, so when we look at most of sort of the, the, the presentations of lithium brines, um, when you look at most of the ones in, in Nevada and California kind of related to, you know, sort of the Great Basin extensional systems. And also when I look at all of the work that we've done in the smack over for the last five years, we always end up, when we look at the geochemistry, we always need some highly evolved um, sort of uh, silicic volcanic geothermal fluid to be the source of the lithium effectively coming into the system. And it, it's quite easy to see when you're working in quite limited. So if you look in, say, the Clayton Valley in Nevada, where you've got, you know, it's, it's a pretty small, pretty small system to look at, you always end up having to evoke some sort of highly enriched late stage magmatic fluid coming into that system to, to generate most of the geochemical ratios that you end up, you know, trying to sort of rationalize through some sort of geochemical Kung Fu some other way. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to throw, throw that out there. And, and certainly the work that we've been doing in the Smack over for the last five years, um, we see uh, a similar sort of series of trends in the lithium content versus a lot of the other major major ions that we need to invoke some other some other uh, magical source of fluids kind of uh, tends to tends to get thrown in there as well for, for any of the lithium concentrations to make sense so I'm just offering offering that up based on sort of um, the work that we've been doing for, uh, for for several years now I don't know what your thoughts are on that yeah I mean it does seem like you can't really sort of do this thing do this lithium enrichment in the brine through these sorts of normal processes. I haven't spent a lot of time looking at these sort of like Clayton Valley sort of systems because they're all sort of just, you know, closed basins with a lot of young volcanics. And so the, the source of the lithium is, is probably relatively close by. 
Um, but when you look at, you know, so there are these like, there are fluid inclusion analysis of sort of these like Chevron halides, which are supposed to be meant to represent the earliest stage of seawater that are also very enriched in lithium. And so I think that the only way you can accomplish that is by reacting it with, by having a, a my bet, which could entirely be wrong, um, is that if you have a, a very small detrital component that's sort of, you know, like a trace metal, it might only be like less than 1% of the rock, but it has a relatively high lithium content uh, and you just sort of only, you know, fractionate it a little bit, you only alter it like a little bit with sort of single digit percentages and you only extract a small amount of the lithium. If you have a mineral that's sort of, you know, a couple of thousand ppm lithium and you only tap into a couple of percent of it, that might actually be enough to get you a fluid of sort of tens of milligrams per liter. Um, the problem with that is you'd expect it to sort of be representative in, in bulk rock analysis. Um, and then the other problem is sort of the radiogenic source of that should give you radiogenic strontium. Um, but I have a feeling, and the, the, that, that's the reason that I'm approaching this um, petrographically uh, is in terms of actually determining which phase which mineral component actually holds lithium today? So if, is it the clay component or is it the feldspar component? And if, it's, if alteration is relevant, then you can just analyze the unaltered section of the sample and the altered section and then see how the lithium content changes through diagenesis. And so hopefully that'll say whether or not you can do these things internally or whether or not you have to invoke sort of uh, magical fluids from mysterious sources. But I think that end member hasn't been quantified yet, which I think is an important part of it to sort of, you know, go through this geochemistry kung fu in order to in order to actually figure that question out. Yeah, I think that's. Um, I mean, that, I'm sort of following up the work that Leanne Monk did, for example. She's looked at most of most of these um, lithium representations in brines from a from a sort of a holistic geochemical uh, perspective, and I think. Um, she has tended to uh, sort of land at that, whether you're in the Clayton Valley, whether you're in the Mojave Desert in California, whether you're in <clears throat> the Atacama or various other of the extensional basins in South America, whether you're in the Smackover, you always end up having to bring in effectively a deep-seated magmatic late stage fluid through, you know, kind of mid, mid crustal fault systems. Uh, they're always, you know, always related to extensional tectonic settings, etc. Um, and it, that, that was kind of my, my general comment, but uh, yeah. great. Thank, thanks for the talk. Interesting. Hi, I got one question for you. That was a nice body of work. You showed a um, correlation between uh, lithium enrichment and uh, H2S in some of the uh, produced fluids in, the, in those mud rock systems. And I wonder, you know, it's correlation science, so you got to be careful, but there are... Um, is there going to be a correlation between some of these sort of thin volcanic layers that exist in these mud rocks and uh, lithium concentrations? You know, could that be one of the sources? It's it's low volume, but you know there there is a correlation at least on the uh, geochemical side of when we find you know thin volcanic layers in these mud rocks. Um, there is a elevated sulfur there. You know, there's there's potential for um, kind of usinia in the bottom waters when they're being deposited, and maybe that's a potential source of lithium. Yeah, I mean, I think like one of the challenges with doing this is sort of in, in, a, in a bulk rock scale is you sort of have to do this sort of mental gymnastics about whether or not it's thick enough to supply the lithium that you're talking about. Because I think, um, you know, some of the authors, the original authors in the 90s for the smack over formation sort of um, liked the underlying red beds, uh, the sort of Eagle Mills formation, which are underlying the anhydrites. Uh, but the challenge with that is those that system that bed is only like 15 meters thick. It's not. It's not yeah. like you know if you have a 15 meter thick sandstone oxidized system, but then you have you know tens to hundreds of meters of thick of basinal shales. Uh, it's sort of. I think the shales are a much more attractive option. Um, the when you look in the sort of Alberta systems, because if you look at this, Marcellus, for instance, it, there's a lot of these ash beds, these sort of bentonite mm -hmm. systems. Um, but whether or not they have enough lithium in, in, in the sort of system is, is, I don't think is really known. Um, I've got bentonites in my Cretaceous rocks, for instance, um, where they don't really have that much lithium. Uh, and so hopefully through the petrographic work, because I have samples of those bentonites, hopefully with the petrographic work, you can see is 
Is the reason that they have low lithium is because they've been altered and the lithiums come out, or is the reason that they have low lithium is because they just never had it in the first place? Yep. No, I think that clay mineralogy study is going to be important. Hey, and on your question on the uh, the Bozier, uh, we've got a really wide range of a, a really big uh, geochemical study, a core based study on Bozier. Uh, it doesn't include lithium, but it's it's got a lot of the trace elements you might be interested in. So we could probably uh, identify some samples that may be of interest to look at concentrations of lithium in Bozier. So yeah, contact me afterwards. That'd be brilliant. Thank you very much. Sure. Awesome. The last question is from Jesse Ahren. Uh, Jesse mentioned you uh, you talked about Bozier data. What type of samples or data sets are most beneficial with regards to your research? For example, drill cuttings, formation brine, CWA. I think for this stuff, it'll be it'll be the actual rocks themselves. It'll be it'll sort of be drill cuttings because uh, if you know, you know, the lithium content in the bulk rock sample will be indicative, and you can sort of do you know geochemistry math to sort of figure out if it's a viable source. Uh, but I have a feeling it's going to really come down to the petrographics, and so the ability to make a thin section and to analyze it in situ, uh, I think, is going to be um, a key. A, a, key analytical work that has to be done. So it'll be the, it'll be the cuttings. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Kyle. Uh, I think this, the time is up. And if anyone else has other questions, please uh, email Kyle uh, and ask questions directly. Before closing up the webinar, I would like to remind you of the next Friday seminar, which is in person by Julie Bloxen. And uh, she is from Stephen F. Austin State University, and the title of the talk is uh, Lu uh, Luang Salt, uh, which is related to the, to the two days webinar. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Kyle, again for presenting, and uh, and see you everyone next Friday. Thank you. Thank you very much.